This once grand mansion house in the former German province of Lower Silesia was overrun by the Red Army in the last days of Hitler's Reich. Now part of Poland, it wasn't until after the war that the Soviets uncovered bizarre, top-secret Nazi files locked inside the crumbling walls. The mansion had been used by the SS, Heinrich Himmler's dreaded secret service, the organization that ran Nazi death camps across Europe. The SS files were packed with details of execution and torture. But these were not records of Nazi atrocities. They were ancient documents, hundreds of years old, relating to the trial and persecution of witches. Hitler's henchman, Heinrich Himmler, had secretly amassed the most extensive collection of historic documents about witch trials in the world. The SS chief raided and researched archives in Germany, the Americas, Russia, even India. The so-called Special Witch Investigation files were taken to an archive in Poznan. The Polish Secret Service struggled to decode them. The Special Witch Investigation by the Reich Security Head Office was, bizarrely, carried out in secret. The researchers approached the archives they had to work with and depended on under harmless scientific pretexts. Himmler had embarked on other historic research with a practical aim, to find proof of a superior Germanic culture in the past. Part of Himmler's worldview was rooted in certain ideas about the Aryan people, myths of the Aryan race going back centuries. He employed um, anthropologists, historians, um, geographers to find evidence for the preeminence of the Aryan um, race. Himmler's research wasn't purely academic. The SS chief was also inclined towards the occult. Mystical symbols, as well as traditional military insignia, were incorporated into the sinister black uniforms of his SS. The death's head symbol, which famously the SS wore on their caps, was actually quite an old German military symbol and was first worn by the Prussians in the early 19th century. And it was called the Totenkopf, and uh, it was meant to have been uh, worn as a mark of respect for a German duke who had died. But obviously, it took the Nazis to really give it its sort of real sinister appearance. He was trying to build up something like an artificial SS cult. The reason for this was, uh, in, him in Himmler's view, to strengthen some kind of inner cohesion of the SS, to make it uh, appear as an elite organization, to make it different from other Nazi organizations. As well as distinctive uniforms, pagan-like rituals were also tailor-made for SS troopers. Sun solstice ceremonies were marked with holy fires and solemn speeches. The winter solstice ritual was celebrated a few days before Christmas. The sun solstice ritual was a classic example of Nazi mumbo-jumbo. What people like Himmler were trying to do was replace Christianity within Germany with a new type of mysticism that was based on uh, ancient sort of esoteric German legends and Nordic uh, religions and things about Odin and Thor and runes. Even the SS letters worn on the collar tabs of uniforms were designed as runic symbols. A similar Nordic style symbol dubbed the Black Sun was also etched into the floor of Wevelsburg Castle. Once a home for Renaissance bishops, Wevelsburg became a kind of temple for a new faith of an Aryan-German master race. Witches, mystic rites and runes may be dismissed as a deluded fantasy, but Heinrich Himmler's Nazi mumbo-jumbo would serve a serious purpose, to wed legions of young, loyal German men to his SS cult of death. The SS chief was raised in a middle-class Catholic family. 
the economic, political and social chaos that enveloped Germany after the First World War challenged traditional beliefs. Like many young Germans, Heinrich Himmler became a Nazi convert. He abandoned his Catholic faith and dabbled in the occult. In a time of turmoil, nationalistic ideas like Himmler's Germanic ideology were a popular replacement for the church. This Germanic ideology uh, was attractive for many particular young Germans after the First World War uh, because one has to take into account that after the collapse of the Kaiserreich of Imperial Germany, there was a need to establish a new uh, German national identity. And people were looking, many people were looking for the roots of Germandom, and they thought they could find it in some kind of mystical past. Himmler wanted evidence of this mystical past. Natural features linked to legend, the Exernsteiner rocks near Paderborn were taken into SS protection. I mean, they're an impressive geological feature. And for centuries in Germany, they've always been kind of revered as a place of sort of mysticism, sometimes Christianity. And Himmler just treated them as yet another thing that he could appropriate um, as part of his all-consuming, mystical Nazi religion. The SS chief commissioned archaeologists to dig for relics of ancient Germanic culture. Anything that could support his idea of a great Germanic identity lost in the past. Finding such relics would serve two purposes. They would provide material evidence for Himmler's new Germanic cult and give the SS chief an excuse to direct his terror machine at what he saw as another enemy of National Socialism, the Christian churches. Now, Himmler also believed that Christianity was uh, a degenerate idea. He believed that Christianity would corrupt the moral fiber of the German people, bring down um, the Aryan race. Himmler blamed Christian kings, especially Charlemagne, for destroying his ancient German culture, its holy places, and converting heathen Saxons to Christianity. The SS chief saw the Saxons as martyrs, and in 1935 erected thousands of stones to commemorate their apparent sacrifice. A different kind of fairy tale from the Brothers Grimm also provided the SS chief with another possible excuse to strike at Christianity. The Brothers Grimm, the founders of the German language research, had come up with an interesting theory that among the old Germanic tribes, there had been wise women, priestesses, who were a positive counterweight to the men, the warriors. Apparently, the church then fought these wise women and basically declared them as witches. It could explain the Reichsführer's top-secret witch research project. If he could demonstrate that Christianity had systematically persecuted Germanic priestesses, the keepers of a great national culture resurrected by the SS, the churches could be next on his hit list. The Christian faith was the enemy of Germanic culture and race. With Hitler's approval, the SS chief could strike back. But the Führer was not a fan of Himmler's virulent anti-church crusade or his research into a mystical past. Hitler had very, very little time for all of Himmler's nonsense, frankly. I mean, he famously berated him for uh, trying to replace Christianity, which he regarded as one form of mysticism, with another. And he you know, openly said to Himmler, I, I don't want to become some sort of SS saint when I die. I mean, I, I will turn in my grave. He thought that um, this pseudo-religious activities of Himmler and also the way he tried to undermine the position in, in, in the churches in Germany, that this was probably too early and it shouldn't be done during the war. So he tried various times to stop him. Despite his Führer's objections, Heinrich Himmler continued his witch research project in secret from 1935. SS agents combed libraries and archives for evidence relating to witch persecutions. 
They used false names and IDs to cover their tracks. Their boss wanted evidence of Christian atrocities against Germanic tribes, but the dates didn't match up. The researchers working for this special witch investigation also realized that most of the witch hunts didn't take place in the Middle Ages, especially not in the early Middle Ages, when the Germanic tribes still existed, but in the early modern age, which of course is a strong indication that the motivation was not against the Germanic religion, since that didn't exist anymore at this stage. Even though researchers couldn't find what he wanted, the SS chief carried on regardless. Records emerged of a Margaret Himmler from Markelsheim who was burnt as a witch on the 4th of April, 1629. Was an accused witch an ancestor of Himmler's? Nobody could tell, nor was it clear whether the SS chief ever believed it himself. What is clear is that his secret witch research project was pursued with typical diligence. By 1944, more than 30,000 card files had been meticulously catalogued. For those who have studied the man and his motives, Himmler was much more than a mere believer in mystic Germanic ideology. Heinrich Himmler was not an ordinary man. He was actually extremely clever. He was diligent, hardworking. He was a very fine organizer of institutions and men. He was very good at managing and indeed manipulating subordinates. Of course he was driven by personal ambitions and of course this Germanic and Folkish ideology played a role. But I think first of all he was a politician. It proved to be a highly dangerous, highly effective combination that propelled him to the top. In 1929, Himmler was a tiny cog in the Nazi party machine. The SS, or Schutzstaffel, was a small band only a thousand strong. It served as a personal bodyguard for Hitler and other prominent party leaders. But the then 29-year-old had ambitious plans. His troop would become something special, the Nazi party's elite guard. My honor is loyalty was etched into the blades of their daggers. Tougher, more faithful and obedient than the rest, those who wore the Totenkopf, or Death's Head badge, swore to be loyal and brave to the death. Young men flocked to banners emblazed with the slogan, Germany Awake. By 1931, Himmler's elite SS brand had attracted 10,000 members many from the educated or upper classes who saw themselves as superior to the brown shirts or SA. The psychological appeal of joining the SS and being part of it uh, was the same appeal that young men have today when they want to try and join elite fighting forces such as the Navy SEALs, Delta Force, the British SAS. Uh, you're very much the creme de la creme and it very much says that you know, if you're a member of a unit like that, I mean, you've got what it takes. Following Hitler's rise to power in 1933, Himmler became Munich's chief of police, his SS a kind of auxiliary police force. One of his first actions was to erect the Dachau concentration camp. Work will set you free, suggested the slogan on the Iron Gate, but there was no freedom under SS rule. Critics of the regime were locked up indefinitely without trial or jury. Heinrich Himmler's grandniece Katrin is the only descendant willing to talk publicly about him and his reign of terror. I think he had a certain leaning towards sadism. But I also think that what was much more pronounced in him was his conviction that all this had to be done, that he was fulfilling his duty, and that sometimes you have to be tough and take tough measures. And this is something he doesn't just practice on his opponents, but also on his own SS men. Himmler's rule of terror in Munich made an impact across the country. Regional leaders across Germany appointed him to enforce political order. As more states fell under his jurisdiction, Himmler and his SS were able to counter their main rivals within the Nazi movement, the Brownshirts, 
or SA. Rumors circulated that the SA was planning a coup. Since the 1920s, there had been a strong competition between these two paramilitary organizations of the Nazi party, between the brown shirts and the black shirts, the SS. And Himmler had managed to put the SS in a position that it could serve as a kind of internal police of the Nazi leadership against the rebellious SA. The SA brown shirts were led by Ernst Röhm. He was the second most powerful man in the Reich. Even Himmler's SS was under his command. When Hitler came to power, it was Rom who thought that Hitler wasn't going far enough. Um, and as a result, Hitler realized um, that the SA, which was very powerful, would represent not only a threat to Hitler's grip on power, but also the army, and the, the armed forces were complaining about the SA and its, and its might. And Hitler basically had to choose between the armed forces and the SA. And famously, of course, we get the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, in which Hitler basically eradicates the SA leadership. I mean, literally eradicates. Himmler's SS was deployed with ruthless efficiency to eradicate their brown shirt rivals. As for the SA chief, Ernst Röhm, Hitler dealt with him personally. Röhm had no idea of the long knives that had been drawn against him. He was on holiday, tucked up in a bed and breakfast on a Bavarian lake when his Führer and former comrade burst in with a band of SS men. Arrested on the spot, the following day he was dead, shot by an SS general in a prison cell. SS chief Heinrich Himmler had eradicated a potential threat to Hitler's supreme command, and by doing so, had also eliminated his most powerful rival in the Nazi regime. After the SA leadership was murdered on Hitler's order, Himmler was in a dominant position. He actually had eliminated his um, most important opponents and rivals. The 1934 Nuremberg rally was staged that autumn. Just one and a half years after Hitler's rise to power, Himmler had become one of the Nazi elite. His SS was now 200,000 strong. Hitler supported and rewarded his security chief. Two years later, he would give Himmler command of the entire German police force. Seen here, striding beside Hitler in SS black, Himmler had quite literally become the Fuhrer's right-hand man. The existence of the SS meant absolute security from Hitler's point of view. And that was a system which was not based on a concept of law and order. It was a terror system and terror was even used against the German population. It's the unpredictable nature of this terror uh, which made uh, the SS uh, so efficient from Hitler's point of view. So even people who were telling jokes over some sort of troublemakers could suddenly find themselves under the terror of the SS. Himmler's agents, his eyes and ears, were everywhere. No one was safe. Even friends and Nazi party comrades feared the SS chief, who had the ultimate power to pry into the private affairs of anyone in the Reich. But Himmler made sure that his own private life was strictly protected. Few knew about his secret affair and the letters he received that ended with the words, forget me not. They were signed with one of the SS chief's beloved Germanic runes, one of the same symbols etched into his so-called skull ring. Heinrich Himmler's attitude to women seems to have changed throughout his career. In the 1920s, his brother and best friend both found girlfriends, 
while the young student Heinrich struggled to find love or sex. He painted himself as a lonesome mercenary, suggesting in his diary that he would rather go to battle than go to bed with a woman. Even during his student days, he already prescribed himself a strict code of abstinence until he would marry. All indications suggest that until he met his wife, he had no sexual contact with women. This was likely strongly connected with a deep insecurity in his relationships with women. He just didn't know how to deal with them or how he should behave around them. He eventually overcame his sexual insecurities with a nurse, Margareta Bowden. She was seven years older. They married in 1928 and had a daughter, Gudrun. The man who would go on to order mass murder on an industrial scale was Heine, the doting father and family man. Heine always was the lovely, nice uncle, who was interested in the children, what they were up to, who brought them presents. He was the lovely uncle. And he seems to have been like that with his daughter too. It seems that his daughter also loved him very much and was always really looking forward to seeing him. Marga's diaries show how much she longed to see her father and missed him. Work wasn't the only thing keeping Heinrich Himmler away from home. At the beginning of 1937, a merchant's daughter in her mid-twenties was employed as his private secretary. Hedwig Potthast was soon managing more than his diary. Purely, physically, she had a clear age advantage. She seems to have been very pretty. She was 12 years younger than Heinrich Himmler, which means 19 years younger than Margot Himmler. And then she was a completely different personality. A divorce was out of the question for Himmler. He saw a different and timely solution, to make cheating a matter of SS duty. Himmler told his men that the most important thing is to have children during the war outside the marriage or inside a marriage. So uh, the idea of a, of a second marriage um, actually uh, emerged at this time. The idea that it's as men were legitimized uh, to abandon their, uh, their wives when they find younger, more attractive, uh, more fertile uh, partners. And so at the same time when he propagated these ideas, he also had a mistress. Himmler wanted to breed a racial elite within the SS, while indulging in an extramarital affair. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, SS units were also sent to the front lines. Himmler feared that his bravest, most elite troops might die before they had a chance to sire members of a future SS master race. In October 1939, he issued the so-called procreation order, producing children in or outside marriage was just as important as eliminating the enemy. Himmler certainly saw the SS as being the cradle of a new master race. He's like a Bond villain in a way. I mean, he really does want to create a master race of people who will take over the world. Um, and he wanted SS men who were uh, racially pure, in inverted commas, who had to prove their lineage back to 1750. He wanted them to uh, reproduce as much as possible. So he established things called Lebensborn, which are these homes in which um, SS men were encouraged to go and have sex with the women who lived there. But conservative German officers saw Himmler's policy as an attack on traditional family values. The SS chief had to back down in public, but within his ranks, the so-called procreation order remained valid. The idea of a second marriage was never abandoned among the SS, but it was more uh, eternally propagated and was after this critique from conservative officers, uh, never again publicly announced. Himmler had to keep extramarital affairs hidden, including his own. The affair with his secretary produced a son. He was born at the Hohenlinchen Clinic, north of Berlin, in February 1942. Once reserved for the treatment of prominent Nazis, the crumbling, silent corridors now lie abandoned. This is the only known photograph of the SS chief's illegitimate son. 
On the birth certificate, the name of the father was left blank. Two years later, Himmler officially admitted to the existence of his son and a second daughter. His secret second family was kept out of view in a remote Alpine lodge. It was the price Himmler's secretary had to pay for her affair. Hedwig Potthast's family was horrified. Not that she had Himmler's children, but that they were the product of an extramarital affair. The young mother had to give up her job as his secretary and only saw the SS chief now and then. He was busy orchestrating mass murder, or what he saw as the elimination of the subhuman enemies of the German Reich. Her lover was hell-bent on establishing a new world order under the black banner of the SS. The Renaissance castle at Wevelsburg was its shrine. Himmler wanted to make Wevelsburg Castle, uh, which he got on a hundred-year lease, to be the kind of uh, an operation center for his SS cult, if you like and he adorned it with all kind of Nazi runes, black sun, floors. He had a kind of almost a, a table, very much like almost something out of Arthurian legend, where there'd be 12 chairs. Had Germany won the war, Himmler definitely wanted Wevelsburg to expand it into a kind of SS training school, a place where they could receive uh, sort of quasi-Nazi religious instruction. It was going to become almost kind of like the spiritual cradle of the Nazi myth machine. But there was nothing mythical about the murderous plans Himmler outlined to a meeting of senior SS officers he gathered at Wevelsburg in 1941, just before Germany invaded the Soviet Union. It was a landmark declaration of the kind of war Himmler expected his men to wage in the East. He spelled out in plain terms a vast task of mass murder disguised as security, disguised as executing the enemies of the Reich. But everybody knew that ultimately what the men at that meeting at Wevelsburg were being asked to do was to conduct mass murder on an unprecedented scale. Himmler was planning to make Hitler's vision of a great Germanic Reich a reality. The empire would extend from the North Sea in the west to the Caspian Sea in the east. But there was no room for Jews, Bolsheviks, Gypsies, or other so-called undesirables in their greater German Reich. The march eastwards began on the 22nd of June, 1941. The regular German army, or Wehrmacht, invaded the Soviet Union. SS units followed to wage a war of extermination against Bolshevism and Judaism. Himmler had a very well-formed ideology. He believed that he was a warrior in a racial war, that it was his job to defend the Third Reich against his, its enemies, to destroy its enemies. And chief amongst those enemies was the Jewish people. Regular German army and Waffen-SS units battled the Red Army on the front lines. Behind them, in conquered territory, other so-called special SS commando units fought their war of extermination. Initially, they rounded up men, especially Jewish men, and shot them. The slaughter was soon extended to include women and children, the beginning of the Holocaust. No written order has ever been found. But historian Peter Longerich thinks he may have worked out how the SS chief directed mass murder. Without leaving a paper trail linking him or his men to written orders. The SS killing units in the Soviet Union started first to kill men in military age, then all men, and then women and children. And in order to, to reconstruct how um, this order was passed on to the units, I think Himmler used a special system. He gave general signals, uh, rather vague orders, and then he waited whether his men had the intuition to understand what he wanted them to do. 
and after that he traveled to the places and actually made clear that they understood his orders in a correct way. Although no written orders have been found, the numbers of victims were meticulously recorded. A system of vague, indirect orders and personal visits to enforce them meant Himmler was protecting himself and his murderous SS units. Despite operating within a dictatorship enforced by terror, he was still acting illegally in violation of German and international law. After Himmler's signals were passed down the chain of command and mass murder carried out, areas were declared free of Jews. He was actually uh, on unknown territory. Nobody actually knew uh, how it was like to kill uh, several hundred thousand people within, uh, within a couple of months through executions. And he also knows that, um, that he was actually acting illegally. Historians like Peter Longerich believe a similar system of signals and vague orders was also used by Hitler to trigger the mass murders of the Holocaust. Again, no specific order has been found, but in a speech in 1943, Himmler seemed to infer that he was entitled to kill men and their children. I have decided to find a really clear solution here too. I didn't find I was entitled to exterminate the men and allow the Avengers in the form of children to grow into adults. Himmler claimed that he felt he was entitled to extend uh, the killings to uh, women and children in the Soviet Union. He didn't say that he uh, got a direct order from Hitler, he said he was entitled. And I think that reflects the, the system Hitler used. Hitler gave so general orders, general signals, and waited uh, for one of his men to come forward with a radical solution. In this case, Heinrich Himmler stepped forward to orchestrate a radical solution, the mass murder of men, women and children. Himmler made a speech in which he made it quite clear that the SS and the security apparatus had taken upon itself the job of wiping out the Jewish people. And Himmler, in rather self-pitying terms, described this as being terribly hard and distressing work, but the SS were tough men and they had carried it out. Now, everybody who heard that speech must have known what he was referring to and must have known that this campaign of extermination could only have been authorized from the very highest level by Hitler himself. The campaign of extermination that spread across the East in the summer of 1941 was only the beginning. For Himmler, mass murder was simply a means of making his great Germanic Reich a reality. In his view, uh, the killing of the Jews in the Soviet Union was only the first step in a much, much larger, in a much, much uh, comprehensive program in order to uh, extinguish um, millions of people in the occupied territories of the Soviet Union. The Holocaust was only in a, the first step in a, in a, in a number of, uh, of genocides. At the end of 1941, Himmler was working on the so-called final solution of the Jewish question. Jewish men, women and children were to be transported from all German-occupied territories to the east. SS murder factories like Auschwitz lay at the end of the line. More than a million people were gassed and burned in this one camp alone. An estimated six million Jews were the victims of a racist mania, orchestrated and implemented by Heinrich Himmler. Many historians believe it was not the work of a crazed psychopath, but an ambitious and driven man, determined to carry out what he saw as a vital mission for his country. Heinrich Himmler was not a psychopath. He believed that he was a warrior in a racial war against the Jews and against Bolshevism. And he had to carry that war to its conclusion, ruthlessly, mercilessly, there was nothing pathological about this. On the contrary, there was a logic and a relentlessness about it, and it's that which makes it so frightening. But Himmler's war of extermination ended in a humiliating defeat as the Red Army closed in, and his beloved Führer cowered deep underground in his Berlin bunker. It was there that a BBC German broadcast shocked Hitler. Himmler had nach einer Meldung Großbritannien und den Vereinigten Staaten nicht, aber der Sowjetunion bedingungslose Kapitulation angeboten. 
Hitler was enraged. He'd ordered his forces to fight to the last man and the last bullet. He saw Himmler's offer of surrender as the ultimate betrayal by his most loyal servant. The greater German Reich had been strangled. Allied troops had advanced from the west. After the D-Day landing smashed through Hitler's Atlantic Wall in June 1944. The regular army, or Wehrmacht, and the Waffen-SS were fighting a losing battle on two fronts as the Russians advanced from the east. A month after the D-Day landings, the Schock von Stauffenberg bomb plot exploded at the heart of Hitler's command. The Führer survived the assassination attempt but Himmler, his security chief, had failed. His SS and Gestapo agents hadn't contained the conspiracy. Or had Himmler known more, even allowed the plot to unfold? The next month, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill received a message from Himmler. The content is unknown, Churchill kept it to himself before destroying it. Did it contain a secret offer? Back in Germany, Himmler played the part of the die-hard patriot. As his SS forces were destroyed on the front lines, he enlisted civilians, old men and children to mount a last-ditch defense. <laughs> Hitler had ordered Himmler to marshal what was left of Germany's smashed armies to hold the Eastern Front. But again, the Reichsführer SS failed. By March 1945, the Red Army was only 60 kilometers from Berlin. Himmler was stripped of his command in the East. The SS chief retreated to the same exclusive Nazi sanatorium where his illegitimate son was born. The man who cheated on his wife also cheated on his Führer. Himmler had a visitor, the vice president of the Swedish Red Cross, Count Volker Bernadotte. Through him, he hoped to contact the Allies behind Hitler's back. The SS chief offered to allow some concentration camp inmates to emigrate to Scandinavia in return. Himmler, the architect of the Holocaust, believed he could succeed Hitler and have the Western Allies join him in a new war against the Soviet Union. Uh, Himmler had always a very pragmatic and very utilitarian attitude and he thought, I think, uh, towards the end of the war that he could use uh, inmates of uh, concentration camps uh, in order to start some sort of negotiations with the Allies. And I think that he probably thought that he could find uh, in a world after uh, the defeat of Germany a new role for himself. Maybe something like a um, special commissioner for security in, in Europe, something like this. This is, of course, uh, completely absurd from our point of view, um, but um, one should not underestimate uh, Himmler's uh, ambition and Himmler's ability uh, to change roles. Himmler kept his negotiations secret from Hitler. His Führer demanded a fight to the death, not surrender. A month before he killed himself, Hitler personally decorated what was left of the defenders of the Reich, teenage members of the Hitler Youth. While the young, the elderly, and last exhausted troops were left to face the avenging fire of the Red Army, Heinrich Himmler fled westwards. Hitler held out in his bunker until the 22nd of April 1945, when he declared that the war was lost and he had no more orders to give. His SS chief took this as a signal and openly offered capitulation to the Western Allies. Was it treason, defying the oath etched on SS daggers, my honor is loyalty? Himmler and all who wore the SS death's head badge had sworn to be loyal to Hitler to the death. As far as Hitler was concerned, 
his SS chief had broken this solemn oath. Before he killed himself, he decreed, Before my death, I cast out the former Reichsführer SS and Minister of the Interior Heinrich Himmler from the Nazi party and all offices of the state. Himmler stepped in when he thought his Führer had relinquished command. Is it really a betrayal of Hitler? I think that he in this particular situation thought that Hitler was not able to act anymore and it was his duty, uh, his task to uh, take the initiative. Days after Himmler had offered surrender on his behalf, Adolf Hitler's dream of a thousand year Reich ended in the bunker that became his tomb. Rather than face the Russians, the Führer killed himself. The SS chief had long fled Berlin. His attempts to negotiate a surrender with the Western Allies failed. The victors wanted nothing to do with him. The liberation of concentration camps like Buchenwald revealed the full horror of his crimes against humanity. Many of those who had carried out his cruel and murderous orders were arrested. But like many senior Nazis at the top of the chain of command, the SS chief fled into hiding. Stripped of his black uniform and his troop of terror, Heinrich Himmler was a wanted man. After a reported sighting of him at a police station in the port city of Lübeck, the trail went cold. He shaved off his trademark moustache. His wife Marga and daughter Gudrun were found in Italy. They claimed to have no idea where Himmler was. They would never see him again. Unrepentant, Gudrun Himmler followed her father in remaining faithful to the Nazi cause. After the war, she worked to protect SS veterans and war criminals in a shadowy organization dubbed Silent Help. But in May 1945, there was no help for her fugitive father. He wore an eye patch in a desperate bid to disguise himself. He carried a cyanide capsule as a last resort. Himmler was eventually captured on the run in northern Germany by British troops who had no idea who he really was. He had various options. He could have uh, committed a spectacular suicide. Uh, he could have uh, led a battalion of the SS to a last attack. Uh, he could make a, a last uh, statement uh, transmitted by all German radio stations or something like that. But instead of that, he simply tried to prolong his life for a couple of days. He tried to disappear in the masses of, of German soldiers who tried to uh, get home. Himmler was sent to a prisoner of war camp, unrecognized among captured troops. The man responsible for the murder and incarceration of millions was himself behind barbed wire. It wasn't long before his captors realized who he was. Heinrich Himmler was taken to a villa in Lüneburg for questioning. During a medical examination that threatened to reveal the cyanide capsule hidden in his mouth, he bit down, releasing the poison that killed him. It was a very different outcome to the one that he had promised his SS men that he would take full responsibility for their actions. His attitude uh, to commit suicide in the very last moment after, after unsuccessfully trying to hide somewhere was particularly disappointing for the SS officers because it was in clear contrast to the principles, to the virtues he had preached to them over 20 years. Like his greater German Reich, the once fearsome, all-powerful SS chief was dead and buried in an unmarked grave in a forest somewhere in northern Germany. <laughs>